uh, we're going to talk about three different areas. The first is one, motivating kids today. So what mm -hmm. are the main differences between motivating kids today versus in the past? Um, okay. And the second is going to be reframing success. So what does success look like in a distance learning world? And the third is tech that helps. What kind of tech tools are most helpful to motivate kids to stay on track? So to begin, let's start with the first one. Okay. So which is motivating kids for today. What do you, okay. what are your, like, so the first question is, what's the difference? What would you say is the main difference between uh, motivating kids like in the past compared to what you're starting to see today as a coach? Okay. So the first thing I want to address is the fact that motivation is something that's actually very complicated. Um, someone's innate motivation is um, influenced by their behaviors, different experiences, life experiences, um, just how we make sense of the world. And that's um, motivation. So motivation is a very personal thing, but it's also a very complicated thing. And because of that, I don't think that motivation, motivating a child has changed significantly in terms of the process and the psychological understanding of who a person is and why their behaviors um, are impacted by certain other experiences. But what has changed is the need for families, caretakers, teachers, everyone to be a little bit more intentional about how we motivate our young people. So it's not the it's not that it's new and motivating a child is not new, but it's the intentionality behind it, the added work that we actually have to put in and the consciousness. We can't just be parenting our children without actually consciously thinking about how do I motivate them along the way and thinking about who they are as a person because that changes as they grow, as they evolve. Um, how you motivate your toddler is going to be very different from how you motivate your adolescent um, teenagers struggling through high school. So it's not a matter of it changing, but it's our mindset and our attitude towards how we engage children, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So it, it sounds like, um, based on what you described so far, that it changes because of this context change and, and because our, our context is, is so different. I guess what I'm curious about is like so many kids, one of the things that we talk about is um, the, this change in equity, right? So especially for some of our uh, lowest income um, children, this has been really, really tough for them, mainly because they don't have the same levels of supports at home. So have you been recommending any types of supports for them? Okay, so for entities that I have collaborated with working for, um, we're working with lower income students, it's the biggest part is social interaction. Uh, I think even despite us being in a pandemic, how our children do engage with, with each other, with their friends, whether that is online or whether they have a pod with a small community, that social interaction is critical and what that looks like. How are we actually even as adults communicating with them. So that, that, that whole dynamic of communication is very important in how we keep a child motivated because if they're not talking to anyone, if they're not having anyone pouring into their lives or giving them even the experiences to make sense of the world and make sense of everything that's happening to them, how else do we expect them to be motivated? I mean, what will happen is that with the increase in technology uh, or the increased usage um, during the pandemic is that they're on YouTube, they're on TikTok, Instagram, and that's how they're making sense of the world. And now these applications are great, but if we don't have the persons or the, 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 the information being processed with them, then it makes it a little bit more complicated. And this then directly impacts learning and how they choose to learn and how how they become motivated to learn um, because they're getting all of this information and how are they actually making sense of that? And then in, uh, in some cases I've seen, it's actually just demotivating them to even go back to school. Why do I need to go back to school if I can learn from all of these, you know, other more engaging um, tools online? Um, so it's about really figuring out um, 
the 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 social interaction part of it and how they're being guided by not only their friends but adults as well so you mentioned I, and I love this because Brittany you're, you're mentioning something that is very near and dear to my heart like this connection communication relating social connection all of those things like is that the gap here like is is the gap that when you are like in a neighborhood that does doesn't have that level of support, you're what you're lacking isn't always the technology, mm-hmm. but what you're lacking is the connection. And if you mm-hmm. have the connection, then you're much more likely to go through all the steps that are needed because these same students who are struggling are also the same ones who are going on to social media. They're looking for that connection elsewhere. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Because they're not finding it in their schooling. So that they have no choice but to to go to these online systems. Right. Is that what I- you're doing? I definitely, uh, one of my biggest things, even in coaching and when I work with families individually, is the communication aspect. How are you actually speaking to your child? Are you speaking to them in a way that builds autonomy? Are you speaking to them in a way that helps them to feel um, confidence in their decision-making processes? I mean, this is why um, mentorship is proven to be one of the most impactful ways to change someone's life um, because oftentimes in these lower income communities they don't have their parents or they don't have parents who are learned and getting information so um, whenever you have a mentor who is intentionally communicating with you in a way that guides you and helps you to reset your mindset about learning and about yourself um it is so impactful so which is why even as parents if you can speak in a mentoring type of way to your child especially teenagers the impact can be so great so communication to me is the cornerstone of motivation so what do you mean as like a difference between the, you mentioned mentoring and mm-hmm. so I wanted to to cover that. So you, what's the difference between mentoring and say the communication and relating that we were talking about earlier? Is there a different, like, is there a instructional component to it? Like, what do you mean by mentoring? Um, I, I, so whenever you have a mentor or a coach, those conversations are usually rounded, are, are grounded in an understanding of that you're, you're motivating them to do something. That's really what it is, the essence of it. So um, what I really mean is using that general framework or understanding that I am pouring into your life to guide you to do something, to guide you to motivate something. It's, it's, it's more of a posture, I believe, that parents should take on, uh, a posture or a mindset of how you try to pour into the lives of your children. So it's not necessarily, oh, the parent is a mentor or a coach, but the underlying essence of it is how we communicate. I hope that's okay, fair. So it's like from the, <laughs> like the mentoring is like um, communication from the perspective of life coach for example, mm-hmm. or somebody mm-hmm. who's trying to, to help you in, in some way. Oh, that's really cool. I love that yeah. perspective because that, that gives us some idea of, okay, so in what way would you speak to them? And sometimes it's not as the disciplinarian, uh, but it's more just like, okay, if I'm, if I'm trying to help you reach your goal, um, I'm in essence serving as a life coach for you. So thank yeah. you for sharing that. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I guess now when it comes to that first step of like talking about the differences between those those two environments um can you tell us a little bit about um what what practices then like okay can you can you take the theoretical of what you've described and like describe some some stuff in practice like what have you tried that has actually worked with uh, some of the some of the the clients that you're mentoring or like Mm -hmm. maybe it's parents like tips and, and stuff that you've given to coaches that has been really helpful for them Okay, so um, for example, let's say you have a teenage son who is um, very demotivated, not trying to get his schoolwork done, and let's say you're a mom, a single mom, and there's always a lot of tension whenever you try to say, go do your homework, um, stop being on the Xbox for all of this time, I really need for you to do your chores and things like that. I have found that boys, especially black boys, um, tend to want their, tend to interact with 
other men side by side or sitting on a stoop, for example, and having a conversation is so much more impactful than their mom standing in front of them, nagging at them and saying, do this, do that. So what I've done is even ask the moms to take a different approach of let's sit on the bed together side by side because men tend to feel um, a, a bit of resilience or um, they don't like when women are face to face to them like that. Um, so whenever you're beside them and holding what we say in Jamaica is you're holding a reason, um, you're reasoning out life with them. Um, and that tends to be more impactful to get the young guy to be like, okay, mom, I understand what you're saying. Let me go do this. It's more of a conversational approach than a, I need you to do this right now. You know, so uh, that's just even one example of how how we communicate with boys specifically um, to get more out of them. Or, you know, you tend to say, um, go and uh, clean your room. Have you ever shown your child what a clean room means? Or are you assuming that they're going to just know what you mean by when you say go clean your room? You know, so when you speak to girls, more than likely they're going to, you know, clean the room but boys you actually have to say i need the clothes in the hamper and the bed made you know you need to be more specific it's just like for teachers when we're um we say okay i want you to um design a flower boys are just gonna draw that flower they're not gonna color it and you know do a whole fantastic design or they're less likely to whereas girls are going to do the whole all the colors of the rainbow and it's gonna be glorious and beautiful like we actually have to be very true, specific. Right? there's a huge huge difference between boys and girls and you're highlighting so many important things here so you're right. saying that basically they, they just don't like being spoken to and they, they really prefer to be like, like with. side by side having a conversation yeah. But what would what are those conversations? What do they look like? Like, what does a conversation with the the boys look like? What do well, they want to be talking about then? Well, is it like the games that they're interested in, or is there something specific? Well, it depends on who your child is, and I think that more parents need to focus on getting to know who their child is. What is it that they like to do? What is it that they like to spend their time with? My first session every single time with a, a family is what do you want to do and how do you prefer to spend your time? I never ask the parents how I want, what I want them to be doing their kids, what they, I want the kids to be doing. I ask the kids if, what do you want your day to look like? After school, let's say you have to log off at two o'clock, what now? What does that look like from two to 8 p.m.? And they design their schedule. And I find that when they do this, they're more likely to buy into, okay, I'm gonna set specific hours during the week to get my studying done. And it, it, it's like night and day, instead of saying, I need you to study every day at four o'clock. No, let them choose, let them decide, especially, for your middle schoolers and high schoolers, give them that autonomy to start creating um, agency for themselves. Um, instead of being very aggressive and saying, I need this to fit into my time, take a step back and think about, well, what do you want and how do you want your day to look? Human, you're developing into a person. And I think we have to really speak and engage our children um, as little people um, who have a decision to make and can make a decision. Oftentimes we, at least in the Caribbean, we come from a culture of you need to listen to me versus let's make a family decision together. And that conversation is very different and you can, it, it's a lot more impactful. So while it is that there's still some structures a parent needs to put into place, like, you know, we're gonna have chicken and rice for dinner, okay, how do you, would you like to help me prepare it in the kitchen? So even my three-year-old, he is an active part of helping to prepare dinner, even if he's learning just, you know, Aww, using awesome. a plastic knife, yeah. And I find that yeah. that makes him want to eat the meal more. Before, you know, he's super picky, but if he makes it, he will eat it, you know what I mean? So um, agency is a huge deal in motivation. Oh, that's huge. Like I have a picky eater as well. So you're saying like basically getting them involved with some of the process is kind of mm -hmm. half the battle for getting them to eat some foods that they may or may not like. If they're involved with creating it, they know what's what went into it. And so mm -hmm. they're going to be less likely to go, no, I don't want it. <laughs> right. So, exactly. Huge. So communication and autonomy are my top two things um, to help you motivate your child. And <laughs> I would say the next thing would be competence. 
once a child feels like they have developed a skill and that they can do this, they're more likely to want to keep on doing it and to develop that skill. And that's what we see in video gaming. This is why kids love video games. They are, they're being challenged in the right ways. So it's not too hard and it's not too easy. And in many cases, especially with AI, it can customize based off of that child, uh, which is really cool. Um, and it motivates them to keep trying to keep going because they're, they're developing a skill and they feel more and more competent and that keeps them motivated. So it's the same principle that we need to apply also in schooling. Um, it's very difficult for teachers generally to do personalized learning, but it is so impactful. And I think that's where technology can really play a role in how can we customize challenge-based learning for our children to stay motivated? So skills and learning new skills is a great way to keep kids motivated in a, in a managed and personalized way. I love that. Like you want to make sure that you can, if you're going to use like gamification principles, like apply them to a skill, a new skill that they're trying to learn they're going to be much more motivated to do it because they're going to start to see some of that payoff. And so exactly. a lot of the question would be like, what is that level zero or level one, the initial level so that they can get some payoff fairly quickly. And then how do you incrementally, like how do you just lay out the structure so that they can, they can see some wins along the way. And I think that that's the, the, the real challenge of our, our day is we're so used mm -hmm. to games that have already thought of this. And then mm -hmm. when we give them something, it's like, oh, you got to do all the homework. And yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's a little bit too much for them uh, at this time. So I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because that's that's an important concept. Right. And even with the whole homework conversation, which is why when I ask a, ch a child, you know, how do you want to spend your time? Uh, most parents want their kids to do well, depending on the school, they have homework to do every night. But in some cases, especially in high school, you have to manage when an assignment is due. It could be due next week. So when do you actually get that done? So instead of saying, oh my gosh, I have to do homework every night, they set, okay, Monday, Wednesday, Friday from 2.30 to 4.30, I am committing to getting schoolwork done. And then I teach them different techniques in getting that done. So it doesn't mean I'm going to sit down and you know write a ridiculous amount of um, index cards and make notes. They're going to sit down I'm, I teach them how to sit down and plan out their time. So whether we're using Google Calendar or Google Tasks, they plan how they're going to get the tasks done before they even start studying. So all week long, they already know um, what they're going to be doing and they plan that and make their own decision instead of somebody saying, go study, go do this. And I found that to be just transformational in at home relationships with parents and children um, mm -hmm. in making them set their own challenges with their schoolwork. So it is this concept of um, using like their own time scheduling or their t mm -hmm. planning for their time so that that could also lead into uh, like, it's kind of like level development in a game exactly. uh, so that they, they have more control over how they spend their time. Uh, and they ended up working on like basically the things that they want in the sequence that they think mm -hmm. makes sense. So then you don't need as much planning or thinking about it yourself, you can exactly. get them involved with that process, which is huge. I and love then, this. Yeah, and then what's worked for the parents. So you know, there are a lot of kids that love stuff like Roblox or Minecraft or Among Us, all of these new games. Um, what I've done is that for my clients specifically, um, each task that the child does from that Monday, Wednesday, Friday, tasks are valued at different points, right? So if a child for the month achieves, let's say, 25 points based off of the tasks that they have achieved, that equates to a certain amount of Roblox or a certain amount of time that they can use online because that's what they like or whatever it is that they like, we allocate, allocate the points to that. And every month, the number increases how much more they have to do. So then studying moves from Monday, Wednesday, Friday to maybe every day of the week, you know? So depending on the child, we kind of do a whole scale to determine what is going to motivate them. And I bring, I want to also just say that um, these rewards, um, whenever you're giving your child a reward, that is not sustainable because it doesn't keep them motivated. You have to change the game. Just like in your video games, it has to be incremental. The reward has to change. And that is um, also, you have to have a real conversation and manage that in terms of not praising the reward, but praising the process. So. 
Interesting. Interesting. So, uh, like, I, I thought we were originally talking about um, external, like, intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. But um, there's this element of praising the process uh, mm -hmm. as well, like, so giving rewards on the process. Can mm -hmm. you give some examples of what does that look like? So the praising the process is instead of saying, oh, my gosh, you got A plus on this test. You're so smart. The conversation is more. I think you worked really hard on getting this done and it is so deserving. Um, I want to see you continue to excel in this skill. You're praising the A versus the A. Um, and, and what happens is that kids get very focused on what ha they start to define their whole identity on the reward versus the actual, I am very good at preparing for a test. The idea is, oh, I'm an A student. And then what I've even found this week with a new client is that's what was happening to him. And then he went into a new school and realized everybody has A's. I'm not special, you know? And now he's having a whole identity crisis of who am I? What role do I play? I am a horrible student. I suck at school. Like all of this is now going into his head because he was always being praised on the on the reward, on the, the medal that he got for first class first in the class versus the skill that he was actually implementing to put into being a great achiever in school. 